that one. <laughs> Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to ask the bishop to get us started. Everyone, can you hear me? I'm having audio issues. We can hear you. To have all of you. Uh, thank you for spending some time this morning with us um, on uh, this new initiative and new ministry in the cult with the Cultivate team. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, give us all open hearts and minds to know that indeed you are in charge. Send your Holy Spirit upon this group as we begin a new opportunity for abundance and grace and looking to see how we as the church can better be disciples not fearing what's around us or who might get in our way. Grant us grace and patience, opportunities galore to be able to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you today that we are able to gather together. And we thank Jonathan for his presentation and his wit and his humor and his expertise to help us move our congregations and the synod where you would like us to be. Bless our time and grant us your grace and peace in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us. I'm, I want to start with um, uh, Pastor Jonathan Coleman, who uh, has graciously given his time yet again. I just can't tell you how, how generous he has been. Uh, over the last uh, year, especially. Um, and uh, he is the pastor of Connections and New Ministry Development at Anderson Hills United Methodist Church in Cincinnati. Um, but, but he is not one of those pastors who's only in the building. In fact, I think he hates it if he's stuck in the building. He, is, he likes being out and about. Um, that is where his call has led him. He leads a network of, is it nine right now or how many do you have right now um it is now nine we just started up a fresh expression that we originally did uh before the pandemic so yes it's good it's you're nine. back to nine yeah there back, was a little wobbling and then back it's up again. still uh, the excellent. assisted living centers kind of go up and down but yes we're, we're keeping people safe yes excellent so nine fresh expressions um you'll hear that term later um more but these nine fresh expressions are in the cincinnati area and then he also provides training and coaching in fresh expressions ministries in the west ohio conference of the umc uh he and brad acock uh, who is the director of the umc's west ohio conference's office of missional development have been so generous in sharing what they have learned in this work with us and partnering with us as we take our first steps so we are really delighted to have him with us today. We first um, asked him to speak at the Cincinnati conference, invited him to come, oh gosh, early in COVID, uh, April maybe of last year, or was it this year? I think it was last year. Um, anyway, he spoke to the Cincinnati conference. Uh, so they have already uh, heard some of this uh, but we want to hear, we're, we're happy to have what he can share with us today, which will kind of lay a foundation, and then we'll go on to talk about uh, what we've been doing specifically in the Southern Ohio Synod. So welcome, Jonathan. We're so glad to have you with us. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Um, I appreciate the prayer, Bishop Suzanne and, and Pastor Katie, for your hospitality and giving my tech all uh <laughs> all aligned here and we'll see if it works now but uh i appreciate everything and it's good to be with you all this morning i'm going to go ahead and share my screen um pull up my fresh expression presentation here and is everybody does everybody see that yes okay I'm going to go ahead and I'll just talk a little bit about my family. I'm, I'm, uh, 
I've uh, been married to my wife, Kim, for 29 years, and uh, she's a kindergarten teacher at Air Elementary over in Anderson Township. Um, we currently live in Amelia. My daughter's at home uh, with us. She's 24, and she uh, graduated from Otterbein University, um, Westerville there, and uh, she's uh, working from home today, actually, and she just got engaged in, in June. And then my son is uh, an architecture student at Miami uh, University. So um, we're, uh, we're really blessed to uh, be able to be together and, and uh, just kind of um, explore life in this new reality that we have. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my background as far as being a United Methodist pastor. I was, I was started out as a youth pastor in 93 and then 95. While I went to seminary, uh, was a student pastor, and then I've had several appointments across West Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church. And uh, for the past 17 years, I've been back to Cincinnati. I've been tethered here uh, because of my wife's job. And so, um, so I've been able to be here in Cincinnati and kind of see, you know, what's going on um, as far as uh, what's happening in the Natty. <laughs> And uh, for 10 years, I was an Air Force Reserve chaplain as well. So I got a lot of experience just being out in the squadrons and uh, doing ministry outside of the uh, wing chaplain office. Um, I was appointed to Anderson Hills in, in uh, 2018. And I want to talk a little bit about that appointment. Um, Katie said, I'm the pastor of Connections. That's the first part of my title. Um, I take care of all the hospitality ministries uh, at Anderson Hills, and then also I oversee our men's ministry at Anderson Hills, and then I'm uh, one of the preaching pastors, and I mostly preach at the contemporary services that we have. Um, the second part of my title has to do with my presentation today as the pastor of new ministry development, and so I have a hybrid type of present <laughs> or type of uh, um, appointment by the bishop to uh, to Anderson Hills. And so like uh, Katie said, um, I've been doing nine uh, fresh expressions that would be full functioning. And we're actually looking at the possibility of doing one in a jail um, at the Hamilton County Jail. And so we're exploring that uh, right now. Um, I do fresh expressions in breweries, assisted living centers, VFW posts, uh, art studios. And so those are some of the fresh expressions that I, we currently have. We also have a team of people that go um, down to uh, the uh, people who take care of the horses and some of the jockeys um, down at uh, Belterra Park here in Cincinnati, and we're looking at the potential of doing a fresh expression there. Uh, right now we feed people there and we're looking at adding worship to that. Um, this, this presentation's really a snapshot um, of, of what I'm, I'm currently doing. Katie mentioned that I'm a regional trainer for Fresh Expressions um, United States. And typically this vision day as what it would be called would be a full six hour time together during the day, which Fresh Expression does around the country. And so I usually stay in the Midwest and help some churches with, with uh, vision days. So what I've done is I've taken this, this uh, six hours and combined it into probably about 40, 45 minutes, maybe even less. But I, I think it's important too to answer questions at the end. And, and that usually takes take some time. I want to I want to be here and available for you. And then also Katie can also share uh, my information with you um, because I've assisted uh, other churches uh, to develop fresh expressions. So I'm going to go ahead and begin and away we go here. So I want to tell you a little story about how I got to uh, what I'm doing, um, the path, the journey um, these are some of the fresh expressions that I currently do with, with the addition of 
uh, the assisted living centers at, uh, at the Glen Senior Assisted Living and Anthology, and then also at the New England Club here in Anderson. Um, I, I do a fresh expression at Little Miami Brewing Company, Dead Low Brewing, Big Ash Brewing, Colorful Cupboard Arts, and uh, the 318, post 318 uh, uh, VFW that I'm a part of as a military uh, member. Um, prior military. And so uh, I want to give you a little story. I was, I was a pastor at Mount Healthy United Methodist Church. We had about 80 in worship, and most of the, the folks were, were seniors. And I was blessed to be appointed there to try to activate and, and turn around that church and activate them into ministry and uh, change mindsets um, there in Mount Healthy. And um, it was definitely, like I said, an older congregation, and they, they really had a lot of activities that were inside the church where they, they had an attractional model of having people come in and experience those ministries. And at the same time I was appointed there, there was a co-op that was meeting in the, in the building where there was a, a moms and dads who were uh, teaching uh, kids just different various subjects, um, you know, preschoolers and, and also, uh, you know, just elementary age children. Um, and, and I noticed that these, these folks weren't coming to our worship service at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, even though I invited them. And they, they always called me Pastor Jonathan. They, they were very hospitable. We were hospitable to them. And, and I just couldn't get them to come to our traditional service at, at Mount Healthy. Well, one day they invited me to a brewery uh, called Fibonacci Brewery on Compton Avenue there in Cincinnati. And uh, I noticed that this brewery had picnic tables and it had a, a really nice brew, brew, brewery room um, where they served the beer and everything. And I saw the, the power of that, that brewery for a gathering place, multi-generational gathering place. And in that invitation, they, they had a potluck dinner. I, I sat and just was able to ask them questions, meet new people, meet their kids. And I thought about what, what, would, be, what would be a possibility of doing a worship service there? And so um, I began to explore some things uh, with our leadership and uh, see if there was a potential to, to host something like that at the brewery to be able to meet the spiritual needs of those, those young families. And so um, we began doing that. I had a, a couple that was helping me um, with a, a, a dinner church that I was already doing, which was over here in the Anderson Township area. Um, it was just a, a group of people who uh, had left the church and I was, they were mostly friends who had left the church and I was doing um, a, a little church service in a living room and having communion um, with them. And this couple who, who did music, I told them about the vision of, of having, um, you know, this a worship service at this Fibonacci brewery. And so they jumped the board and we began this service <laughs> and it was really cool because these families came to it and, um, un, you know, unfortunately they, they still didn't come back to church. And I think that was the expectation of the congregation. We were, well, why aren't, why are you doing this service outside the church and why aren't they coming back and experience worship, um, worship, uh, at, uh, at Mount Healthy United Methodist Church. And so eventually, uh, to make a long story short, I was able to uh, talk to my district superintendent about what I was doing. Um, I saw it as a potential for something greater. Um, began to make friends with individuals who uh, were built, at one time were building a brewery in Milford, Ohio. And I just started networking with, with people um, in that brewery to be able to lay the groundwork and foundation work to 
uh, begin a brewery uh, worship service there at uh, Little Miami Brewing Company in Milford. So this is a kind of a compact story, but it led to my appointment by the bishop to Anderson Hills in 2018. Um, so I was moved from Mount Healthy um, to Anderson Hills just on the, the just from diving taking the diving board off of uh, what I experienced at Mount Healthy with this brewery. And um, eventually in 2018, in the fall, I, I began a worship service at the Little Miami Brewing Company, which now uh, we, we do uh, two services a month at the Little Miami Brewing Company. And so uh, that's grown. And um, it's just been a pretty awesome journey. And that's just a really quick snapshot of how everything has grown. I developed a core team of, of people who helped me in the breweries. And then I developed a core team of people who helped me with the art experiences. And then I have a core team of people that help me with the uh, senior assisted living uh, services uh, outside the church. Um, so that's, that's really making a long story short. And, uh, that's, that's how I'm in this hybrid appointment now. Um, so kind of getting into the nuts and bolts, how do we reach, um, how do we reach people outside the church through the ministry of fresh expressions? And so how do you get from here to there with this chasm, um, and so there's a couple of ways that we, we know of. Um, first is the, is the attractional way, option one. You know, you put up a sign, you welcome people, you hope that they come to us. Um, we offer hopefully good worship services and ministry that attract people out there to us. Um, and so for quite a long time, the method. Um, come to us at a time that fits us, and we'll designate that time, and we'll designate the style that we decide. And so I think the church, the Western church, is constantly uh, trying to figure out how to be attractional, and, and there's all kinds of different ways that we try to attract people um, into the, the church, the, the brick-and-mortar church. Um, there's option two, which is the engaged. Um, you go out there, you engage people, you invite them to come uh, with us to church as we get to know them and they get to know us. Um, there's a possibility of doing outreach that connects people out there. We develop relationships, we serve them, we help people, and then we ultimately invite them to take the next step to come back, uh, maybe in a form of discipleship or what I like to call uh, second door ministries, which could be uh, like a Weight Watchers or an AA meeting uh, like that. It, this is good, um, but I believe there's another way that churches can engage that has not typically been on the radar, and that is the incarnational ministry. And so Fresh Expressions creates a space for us to consider that way of reaching new people. Um, it is option three. It's going to provide a ministry with people out there where they are. And we go into the world, we build relationships, we love and serve and help and live alongside of them in their affinities, in their hobbies, in their places where they like to meet. And um, I don't really typically circle back and try to bring them into the existing church. Um, I'm a pastor of many flocks um, outside the church. I, I, I have my own congregation, but they, uh, I would say 96% of the people um, don't walk through the doors of Anderson Hills, even though they're experiencing a ministry of Anderson Hills. So um, we form church where they are with rhythms and rituals and structures that make sense um, within the culture. Um, so, uh, let me move my screen here. So where do these, where do we do these fresh expressions of the church? Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about 
just this question, what is the largest hotel or motel chain or taxi service in the world? And we can think of various things, you know, either Yellow Cab or Hilton or Marriott. Um, but in the world today, we have uh, Uber and Airbnb. And it's fascinating that Uber doesn't own cars and Airbnb doesn't own a single hotel or motel. Um, they utilize other people's material things, um, houses and cars. And so that's really uh, what a fresh expression is all about to utilize places where people are. And so th again, these are, these are just different places that I do uh, ministry. And um, I'll get into the power of the brewery because I, I, I see those as, as powerful multi-generational um, uh, gathering places. Of course, we have art studios out there where people come and they might have a glass of wine and, and a group of gathering of gals or guys that come and paint and have fellowship. And uh, I do those in different areas. Of course, senior assisted living, um, people are walked in or wheeled in to the services that I do there. And so I, I utilize other spaces um, to do worship and discipleship ministries. Um, I, the other metaphor that I think of, I'm a food truck with the DNA or, or food that comes from Anderson Hills. And I'm just the one outside feeding people um, in various places. And so that's, that's a metaphor that I, I attach to as well. So um, anyway, this is what a fresh expression is. It's a form of church for our changing culture. And it is established primar primarily for those, uh, for the benefit of those who are not yet members of any church. Um, however, I'm, I'm seeing in my fresh expressions that I, that I do, that I host with my core teams, that there are a lot of people that maybe have been harmed by the church in some way, have left the church for some reason. And uh, I, I see a lot of that. And so these are, these are ways of reaching them. They, they don't feel like they can trust walking into the brick and mortar um, anymore for some various reasons. So um, these are some of the other characteristics of fresh expression focus. Um, as you can see, I, I don't want to insult your intelligent intelligence and read the slides <laughs> um, to you, but you can see these ways um, of, of how we focus in on just mission and in and, and the culture and just reimagining ways and different ways. And I'll, I'll give you some of those ways that I see some of my colleagues doing uh, ministry and just committing to new and existing forms of church is, is, is really thinking outside the box of what church is uh, today. Um, choosing an affinity or genre, um, coffee shops, legion posts, breweries, running clubs, uh, quilting clubs, um, various ways in which uh, people are hosting in some way. Um, I, I've uh, asked some people to host dinner churches and if they have kind of an open concept in their home of, of hosting in a dinner church in, in their house and inviting people who don't have a church home. Um, these are some of the characteristics of, of Fresh Expressions. Uh, we're attached to Anderson Hills. Um, we try to get our congregation to be invitational of people who, uh, who don't have a church, friends, relatives, neighbors, associates um, who don't have a church. And so um, inviting them to come to breweries, to come to the art studios and developing a culture of invitation. Um, a lot of times it goes outside our traditional ways of worshiping and traditional ways of doing church. Um, I've had some pretty creative, fresh expressions done um, that, that includes some music, but maybe some secular music that's, that's uh, involved in the theme. Um, but it's really engaging those who may never walk into that building. A smaller scale, um, I know uh, a pastor that has 
19 different fresh expressions um, that operates in his church. And some of them are, are just five or six people who, who meet together for a, a brief devotion uh, time. And these are people who don't go to church, but uh, they have a lay person that leads in that devotional time. And then they go on a 5K run. Um, and so that's kind of thinking of some smaller scale um, ways in which I'm trying to move my camera. Sorry. Um, I can't see that last <laughs> point there. Um, tell you what, Katie, I'm going to let me do something here. There we go. Before you okay, move so, on, can I let yeah. Richard had his hand up for a question. Maybe he could squeeze it in quickly. Okay, sure. Sure, Richard. It ended up being on the next slide, but I, I just read ah. the book about expressions, and I really like that notion of third spaces and thinking of you spend most of your time at home or at work, but then people often have a third space that they spend time in, and that's where we're looking to find people. Or yes. meet, we meet with people, you know. Yes. No, that, yeah. Yeah, I love that term, Richard, uh, third spaces. Again, it is. It's in, I'm sorry, my dog is wanting to go out. Um, good old Zoom. Um, yeah, those affinities and, and other places that have to do with um, where people are gathering, but, but, but also hobbies that people um, yeah. have. So, no, I, I love that term, Richard. So these are some of the common elements. Um of fresh expression. Um, our uh, local, uh, the local faith community has the potential to uh, uh, mature into expression, expressions of church that might not even look, look like our notion of church outside different various ways in which we practice the various things in our worship services, like a, a litany or a call to worship or even the sacrament or hymns or, or whatever. It could be uh, various creative ways um, that we can have these elements in there. And then um, it's, it's attentive, like it says to the microclimate, that environment of the group of people in the third places that, that have those interests and passions, hobbies and meeting uh, in places, um, which uh, like I said, the, the brewery, and that's what I want to get to here. Um, I'm not trying to push you guys to the brewery, but I'm known throughout the country as the brewery, um, um, the brewery pastor. <laughs> so um, I, I see the breweries as the new coal mines, um, which is a, that Wesley went to the coal mines where, where he said, the world is my parish. And he went out and preached at the coal mines at the entrances of the coal mines where people gathered in and uh, listen to him before they went to work. And so um, there's 57 breweries, by the way, in Cincinnati, um, all over here on the, in the tri-state area. Um, these are some of the just nuts and bolts or how to um, of, of getting started. Um, just really evaluating your sending community for fresh expression ministry, casting vision through Fresh Expression Vision Days or uh, through a presentation like this, getting your congregation to pray uh, in ways of, of going out uh, to uh, reach people in various places and, and, and really getting them uh, praying. And, and I've seen God open up, um, just open up opportunities um, as, as the congregation has done that and and just check checking on the pulse of the congregation on their willingness um of course teaching them the scriptures um like for example in the book of acts i mean you have philip and the ethiopian eunuch um pretty powerful uh way of of philip just jumping up into that chariot um because he heard uh this this ethiopian eunuch reading out of the book of isaiah and asking him the question, do you understand what you are reading? And then again, just jumping up into that, that um, chariot and explaining some things to them as, as you go on the way. And that's a lot of, of what fresh expressions do. You join people where they're at or where they gather and you go on the way with them. 
And what happens in that? The, the Ethiopian eunuch uh, says, what's keeping me from being baptized? And they find a body of water and he is baptized. I, I think it's really cool that he asks that question. And so their, their God stories intersect there in Acts chapter 8. And then Philip is pulled out and taken somewhere else to do ministry outside uh, the brick and mortar. And so uh, this, the second thing that I do is I constantly communicate to the congregation uh, what's happening. Uh, August 3rd, I'm doing a luncheon at the church, and I'm inviting anyone in the congregation to come and see what we are doing how we're doing it and invite them to be a part of it so that I can grow my teams and grow uh, the fresh expression opportunities. Uh, my goal is to have uh, just various fresh expressions that I'm not leading, but that they're leading in the congregation. And so um, that's, that's the thing that, that uh, I dream of constantly as, as the pastor of new ministry development. And so the, the last thing there is, is raising up pioneers, supporters, and permission givers. And I want to get, in, get into that uh, a little bit now. Um, this is normally a, about an hour, hour and a half presentation um, at Fresh Expression Vision Days. These, all three of these are needed um, in a congregation uh, to be able to initiate a Fresh Expression. Um, Anyway, I want to just give you examples in Anderson Hills. We, we have the leadership that are uh, our permission givers. Uh, when I first came to Anderson Hills, I, I told them the vision. And of course, money needed to be raised. My, my salary, half of it comes from the conference and district and half of it comes from Anderson Hills. And they, they bought in, they gave permission and then they supported it financially. And then I have a, a core team of supporters that come alongside of me and other pioneers that I've uh, raised up um, in the church with God's help to be able to help with marketing and music and hospitality and publishing um, and, and technical uh, things that we need um, in those ingredients that we need in fresh expression. So, um, Anyway, I want to tell you the story of, of Laura and Sharla and how I came to uh, begin this fresh expression at, at an art studio. I was doing a presentation in um, 2019 of, of, of how our fresh expressions were going. I, I did a, uh, a lesson on what a pioneer is, and I'll, I'll give you that in a few minutes. Um, and... Laura and Sharla came up to me after this luncheon that we had, and they said, we've been praying about how to connect with our customers in our art studio. And they also paint kitchen cabinets and everything. And, and um, they, they said, we have the gifts to be able to do a painting. And if you can match it with a biblical theme and we can, uh, do a worship service with music around that theme and get the people to paint the experience. Um, that's what we kind of envision. And, and we put that together just with the Holy spirit. That's the only way I can explain it. It was all Holy spirit led. And we, we began that. Um, and we have had up to 35 people. Um, and normally there's, probably 75% are people that are invited by our congregation and they bring those friends or relatives to those experiences. And we allow people to come as they are. Um, there really aren't any restrictions. And so we have some gals that always bring their bottle of wine when they paint. I guess they're just used to doing that. I've had a a husband bring a six pack of Bud Light. And so it's, it's one of those things that just occurs outside the church and we develop the community. And a lot of them have, have called me their pastor. And so they come to these experiences and man, Laura and Charlotte could do more. They really could. I mean, I, they could lead more 
um, but they're kind of tapped out on their time. We could do more, maybe two or three a month, but right now we only do one a month. And so that's just how I discovered some pioneers within my congregation. Um, so you're probably asking, what's a pioneer? Um, a pioneer. Jonathan, right? before we yeah. go on, I know that uh, Pastor Frudenberger and Pastor um, Kinnanen have questions. Oh, okay. Go ahead. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, this is tangential, but I'm finding that the painting studios, we've actually hooked up with one. They charge like 30 bucks for a session for an hour, hour and a half. Have you cut a deal with this paint place that they're not charging that kind of money? Uh, yes, we, we currently uh, purchase, I, I get a grant from our district um, to purchase uh, just some, uh, what do you call those things? Like the, the, the canvases that you paint on, the paint, the paint brushes, yep. the tables and chairs. Um, I, I got a lot of those things pre-COVID. And then we always have about 50 to $70 of, of hospitality food for people to, uh, um, we normally take a break during the painting just to let the canvas dry in order to put the second layer. And so um, the expense of, of renting or anything is it's not there um, okay. uh, with, with Laura and Sharla because um, th they just see it as, as their ministry um, to these people in a ministry for Anderson Hills. Thank you. Okay, and my question is, is the uh, Fresh Expressions group simply trying uh, something that I could equate to in my mind, like a, a, a group of people in the community with a faith element as a part of it? Um, you mean like, you mean that these folks already have a faith element in their life? or? Well, I'm, I'm not sure where the faith element comes in. Is it just a part of the group as the group is set up? Or is it an add-on? Is it the main focus? Is it a prayer worship service? I, I could get it. Yeah, I'm going to get into those details of, of okay. maybe what that what that worship experience looks like, if that's what right. you're asking. Yes. Right. Yes, and, and do the people come expecting faith to be a part of this expression? Uh, yes. Yes, they do. Okay, okay. Yes, and you'll do. get into that later. Right, right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. So these, this is what the, the pioneers look like here. They, uh, and that's what Laura and Sharla are doing. Um, and I raised up a, another pioneer uh, to help with that art experience. My leadership capacity only goes so far. I can't lead all nine of these. And so um, I'm really trying to multiply my pioneers um, to where they're doing the ministry outside the walls. And so I look for these characteristics in people, um, the characteristics here and what a pioneer is. And so I'm going to have a young, uh, young man leading that uh, art experience, uh, doing a message. And uh, of course, we have some some painting that happens at that uh, art experience. And that's done by Laura, who is uh, one of the uh, art studio owners. So this is, I kind of hit this a little bit, but it's just, if, if you, as you get to know your congregation, you know, you, you really look for owners of where you, where you can host some of these things. Um, there's fresh expressions that um, meet in coffee shops or restaurants. There's fresh expressions in tattoo parlors. There's fresh expressions in gyms. Um, I, I have a fresh expression in a brewery, uh, and the connection came through a person that's an investor in that brewery. Um, people who have hobbies, uh, some of these running clubs um, or uh, quilting uh, stamp collecting. There's there's just various ways that you can you can host in your home or somebody else's home a fresh expression. And what I do is help those people 
I put some meat on that to where it becomes a faith-based uh, experience um, and uh, equip them to be able to do this. And again, it's made for, it's, it's a faith-based experience for the benefit of somebody who does not have a church. Um, there's another, I, I, all of these places are identified, and this is, this is what Fresh Expression puts this term house of peace on. Um, and, and that's what I've identified, especially in the breweries and art studios and BFW posts. Um, it comes from Luke 10. Um, this scripture that Jesus um, tells his disciples, um, you know, enter that house, peace be with this house. Someone promotes that peace. Uh, uh, it's there. It rests on them and it'll return to you. Stay there, eat, drink, whoever they give you for the, uh, for the worker deserves his wages. Don't move around from house to house. Um, when you enter that town, you're welcome. You eat what is offered you. And so that's the term that Fresh Expressions comes to identifying houses of peace. Um, I have a, a, a story about that. We, we went uh, to Mount Carmel Brew, Brewing and really tried to begin a fresh expression there and just found that the, the brewery was like, okay, we, we want you you know, if you get our catering, if you rent our space, and they gave us a go for two months of doing a fresh expression there, and and eventually the owners are like, no, we really don't want a church meeting in our brewery, and so we kind of shook off the sand from our sandals and said, you know, thank you for hosting us these past couple months, and and so that, that we just identified that building is not a house of peace. And so that's really what Fresh Expression is getting to. Um, eventually, we went to Deadlow Brewery um, through one of our investors that's a member of Anderson Hills. And, and that place is a house of peace. They welcome us. They're glad we're there. Um, I'm getting to know people, uh, servers, bartenders, um, owners there at Deadlow Brewery and, and having a relationship uh, with them as well as our core team having a relationship with them. So our laity who attend, or our core team who attends the worship experience um, and myself just are trying to build those relationships with these houses of peace. And so that's a little bit of a snippet of how uh, Fresh Expressions identifies those places. Um, so you wanna uncover these places of openness and uh, try to just keep the radar on of, of how, um, just how you can engage these places and, and get a foot in the door. Um, Dave Emery from Big Ash Brewery, um, I knew him from way back, um, probably 12 years ago. And he had a, he brewed beer in his basement and he had some folks that brewed, brewed beer with him. And that was the origin of Big Ash Brewery and Dave was just a contact from way back and eventually they they started this brewery and I I blessed the brewery when they cut the ribbon and the Chamber of Commerce was there the key leaders from Anderson Township were there and um, I asked him if I could if I could say a prayer and bless that brewery and uh, it was just really cool to be a, a part of that. And I also blessed Little Miami Brewing Company um, when they cut the ribbon uh, for their brewery. Um, Deadlow Brewery, Ivan, is, is connected to Anderson Hills. And again, he's one of the investors there. And that's how I kind of got my foot in the door there at uh, Deadlow Brewing. Um, so these are, these are just some of the, 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 the questions and responses, you know, just putting putting the radar on of who who are the people of peace and places of openness in your community around you, um, and it's it's a partnership of clergy and laity, um, just engaging and ministering um, to people, um, owners and employees of businesses, and. Uh, 
homes where people are gathering um, already, you know, there might be a dinner group in your congregation that, that are already meeting. And um, that's the potential to become a dinner church. Um, are there people of peace in your church? And, and I, I always ask the question of folks, and we put it out there at Anderson Hills, how many unchurched people do you know and hang out with? Because I think we can get into our holy huddles, um, you know, within our congregation to only hang out with other Christians. And I, I think just getting our, our, the mindset of our congregation to explore, uh, you know, just the potential of, of connecting with unchurched people. Um, so these are just some questions uh, that kind of uh, trailer along with, uh, with what I just presented there. Um, and it, it's this is a fresh expression concept of just who wants to spend time with me? Who do I like being around? And this is a good slide to put in front of the congregation. Um, and just asking these questions. Um, and I, I love question se seven. You know, I think everybody wants to belong, and I'm going to get into that with the story of, of Zacchaeus. Um, you know, I think people want to belong somewhere, and and we go to places where those people are hanging out, and we invite them to belong with us, and we want to belong with them, and just open up that community and have them discover that community. Um, I, I just am so blessed because I, I have a multitude of, of not only flock, a flock of people that I shepherd, but also just really good friends. And we, we actually meet together and I'm, I'm friends with them and we have a life group together and small group discipleship happening that is spun out of these fresh expressions. And so these are just key questions um, that we can ask our, our parishioners. Um, this is what worship looks like. I think it was, it was uh, asked there. Um, this is what we do. This is a half hour worship service um, at the Little Miami Brewing Company. Um, so I'll just let you take a look at that. Um, <laughs> we have the, it's really cool at the end of the service, we have a representative from the Little Miami Brewing Company and they usually come up and say, you know, Thank you for being here. We're so glad you're here with us and hang, stay and hang out. And here's the new beers that we've brewed. Here's the new uh, dishes that we have uh, developed that you can try some of these foods. And um, we have a benediction. And then w there's always questions to engage people um, after the worship service that we hopefully have people staying and engaging those questions to where they see that God's story is intersecting with their story. And um, it just, it, it, it turns into powerful discussions around the table. Um, <laughs> we, we do uh, this little Miami Brewing Company uh, service twice a month at 1030 a.m. And I, sometimes I le I'm leaving at 3 p.m. Um, because I'm ministering to people and my core team is ministering to people. We have prayer partners um that uh that pray we have a faith and friends on tap facebook page with that has a prayer room in it and people can go into that prayer room and share uh prayers and our praises and uh that we see prayers and praises and concerns shared uh, almost every day and so there's a there's an online community that's developed out of this as well um, so you can kind of see some of the ways that, that we uh, are um, connecting them to prayer and then also inviting them to serve. Um, we have a uh, community dinner on Thursday nights at our Salem campus, and we invite uh, the folks that attend these uh, services to come and serve um, uh, a dinner for our community at our Salem campus. Um, 5.30 to 7.15 each Thursday. And we put that out there and, and they take us up on the offer. They, they feel like um, even though they're not a part of the church, they feel like they want to serve people. 
Um, so there's different elements or invitations that we give to folks. Um, we see a lot of people that walk through the doors, uh, again, um, that are looking for more. Um, they're at a point in their life that um, they potentially hear about faith and friends on tap and they just feel like they want to check it out because I think there's a longing in their heart to belong. And, and Zacchaeus, we see the story and this is, this is really cool because I think fresh expressions is all about this, uh, believe, belong, believe, and behave. Um, in the church, we, we normally, um, come together because we believe and we want folks to believe together and we worship um, and that might be something first that's experienced through discipleship and that discipleship will change behavior and we normally think about hospitality coming third um, but I think fresh expressions are all about um, meeting that need of the belonging first and then really inviting them to believe and then eventually through the ministries of discipleship and, and some of the things that we present, they might say, you know what, I, I do want to um, put this past behind me. I do want to put these, you know, just the way in which I'm, I'm utilizing my time and I want to give it to God. And so I, I think that's a really powerful story that Zacchaeus is just uh, wants to see Jesus, and he, he's hanging out in the sycamore tree. He's just trying to get a gaze at him, and Jesus says, hey, hey, man, I want to come over to your house, and, and I think that in itself really changes his longing and belonging. Um, he finds that, that he belongs to the Lord's ministry because the Lord has, has invited him uh, to be a part of his life. And so we see that he believes in that story in Luke. Um, and then his behavior changed. He, he says, you know, hey, right now I'm going to, I'm going to pay back everybody that I've deceived, you know. So we, we see these, these, this story of Zacchaeus. And again, this is ministry of Jesus outside the church. Um, anyway, that's, that's the atmosphere that we try to create at our fresh expressions. Um, and so also I remind my core team about the role of the Holy Spirit, um, that we're constantly looking for uh, um, the new places and, and the church, just constantly um, keeping it before them, the missionary spirit of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I think there's always the sending that happens through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and um, just inviting the congregation to be a part of that, to be sent. Um, and it's greater than, than what we have in our human force or effort that, that the power of the Holy Spirit opens up doors um, in ways that we can't even possibly imagine in creative ways that we can't even possibly imagine. Um, here's the impact on Anderson Hills. Um, I have pre-COVID numbers, and then I have, you know, trying to get back on our feet. Uh, in the, you know, of course, we got this variant now, and so I'll just let you take a look at these numbers. In, you know, 2019, we had 43 fresh expressions experiences, um, which is, you know, averaging, you know, seven, eight. Um, a month. Let's see. Yeah, so far in, in, in 2021, we've had 41 fresh expressions. Yeah, 19, in 2019, this was before um, our art experience and veteran experience at the VFW Post and some of our senior assisted living. So we've grown it. Um, so far, 1,824 people have attended through the nine months. Um, of uh, 2021. Um, we get an average of about 220 people per month. Um, we have one discipleship group that meets, so usually average about 13 people. I, I'm beginning a second one. My, 
meeting together with some, about seven uh, folks at uh, 50 West Brewery just for discipleship, not, not for, for any kind of worship experience. Um, and that, that is uh, next Thursday, September 30th. And so we've had 93 new people um, who have walked through the door of a, for the very first time um, at our Fresh Expressions. And then here's some of the, um, we had a, a, some generous donations to uh, feed some folks at our Thursday dinner. So I invited our, our folks who attended Little Miami Brewing to um, help feed um, people at our community dinner on Thursday. And we had 13 volunteers and uh, people gave $350. So we were able to supply um, that meal for those folks. Um, this is our offering. I, I, that is current. I just added it up this morning. Um, the conference has recognized our, our efforts and ministries through the multiplier award. Um, Bishop Palmer, you know, you get up on stage and he gives you the award and it's, it's really cool <laughs> to, to be able to be blessed and, and recognized by our conference. So that's, that's about it. Um, I want to take any questions and I'll, I'll get out of my, I'll stop sharing my screen here. There we go. That really just sounds exciting and life-giving. Yeah, I think, um, the most difficult thing in ministry that I've discovered um, in, in several appointments in the church is, is just revitalizing the existing congregation. And it's just one of the hardest things and it, it can take its toll on, on uh, pastors. <laughs> and this, this has been the most incredible appointment that I've ever experienced. I was 10, I was 10 years at Clough United Methodist Church. And, and that was, that was awesome. I think there was a lot of trust developed. There was a, you know, we tripled in the numbers, but again, we did a lot of attractional ministry, but this is the most purposeful ministry that I have ever, uh, have ever done. And, and I, I just totally dig it. And mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome to have a Bishop just say, all right, Jonathan, we're going to put you in this hybrid appointment. <laughs> and, and we're, we're starting to see, we're starting to see appointments like mine. And so I kind of pioneered um, clergy appointments to where we're, you know, we're taking some part-time time, a part-time uh, ministry in the, in the congregation. And then we're, I'm able to do fresh expressions outside the church. Mm -hmm. I think that job descriptions should be changed for <laughs> clergy. I think, I think, five, 10, 15 hours should be designated to developing core teams and fresh expressions in the congregation. I really believe that. And I believe this is, this is, uh, this is the new way of doing ministry that's going to transform the ministries of the Christian church. I really believe that because people just aren't coming into the brick and mortar right. and there's so many reasons. And, right. um, I hear those reasons and it's, it, it there's a lot of heartbreak there. Um, yep, yep. Yeah. And, and I find myself having a compassion for the heartbreak Absolutely. and however that's occurred and, and, and seeking ways to meet the person in who they are. And oftentimes they'll say in conversation to me, you're a pastor, which mm -hmm. I kind of get thrilled with that, that how, you know, we met as people coming to know the pastoral relationship. And I have also found that people are wanting to dive deep in conversation. And I love those kinds of conversations. So I don't know, I must foster it because more often than not, people say, whoa, we, we, we dove deep in this one. And um, yeah. Uh, that thrills me because to me, that's the heart to heart conversation. And I think COVID has 
really called us to that soul searching mishmash of, you know, where am I and who, how do I fit into the world and who is it that I serve and, and our, and people are searching for that, but because of hurts in various entities, yeah. they find camaraderie in places like breweries and, um, sip uh, paint clubs and things like that and yeah. as we know when the hands are busy the mouth speaks which is usually fed by the heart mm -hmm. yes yeah i i um i i i have a lot of conversations after our fresh expressions with people and and um the thing that i hear is is that they feel like this, it's a safe place. They feel like there's no judgment. Um, they feel like they belong. And right. we're right. not trying to get them to believe, believe, believe. But I think the first thing is belonging. Um, people want to belong. And um, that's the atmosphere that we try to try to create. And we give them an inv invitation to, um, you know, take that tiny step to move toward faith. Um, but it's not going to be forced on them. And, and right. I, you no, know, it's no. just, it's, it's, it really is all about how they see God, God's story intersecting with their story. And I use that, that slogan a lot um, and, and ask that a lot. Um, our last fresh expression, if you go, if you're on Facebook, you can, you can go to the faith and friends on tap experience and um, like it. And then you can see our past worship services. This past one, um, Saturday, I wasn't there, but, but our laity ran it. And um, uh, one of the ladies that, that has, has come, and she, she doesn't go to Anderson Hills. She's not connected to Anderson Hills, but she's, she got up and shared what God's doing in her life right now and uh, shared her journey through breast cancer. And then um, um, we had a lay person. Um, go ahead and do a devotional uh, right after her message and and people interacted with that um, and again she felt I asked her and she said yes and she she said I had to put a put aside that spirit of fear and and do that and and you know one of the things I think as far as going back to the clergy um, you, we all have things that we're involved in how I got into breweries is I, I enjoy beer and uh, I enjoy various <laughs> kinds of beers and uh, you Lutherans are, I know, I know the Lutheran church. Um, and, and I have friends that, you know, I've made friends with people who have, have uh, you know, built these breweries. And then also I, I took five years of art um, mm -hmm. and then I, I'm a prior military. I'm doing ministry inside the VFWs. And so you kind of see the affinities that are developed through what my story, um, you know, my story has come to be. <laughs> and so we, you all out there have affinities, you have interests, you have hobbies, and um, your laity do. And it, it's just really presenting um, a lot of, of what, you know, you know, just what you've seen today um, before them, just to see what, what they can do to develop a fresh expression. And really it should be lay driven. Um, mm -hmm. I think the pastor is more, pastor is more of the equipper. Um, and like I said, I, I hope that, um, that we can have multitudes of fresh expressions that, that, that I'm, I'm giving guidance to. Um, there was a church, Milford United Methodist Church, um, or no, Trinity United Methodist Church in Milford. There was a lady that began a fresh expression in her apartment uh, building, and they would just cook cook spaghetti and meat in her apartment. <laughs> and she had she had several single moms and come to this fresh expression and they ate together. And she said, "Will you just send me some of your sermons?" And I, I <laughs> all I had to do was cut and paste and pop me pop her some of the sermons and then eventually she asked her pastor to send a summary of the sermon and so you know she just would read or take some ideas out of there and then share her own personal interaction with 
with that sermon. Um, I think we, we are equippers. Uh, pastors are the equippers. Now we might get some of these off of the ground. Um, but uh, I think the lay, lay, lay folks are, uh, are the ones that are, these lay pioneers are the ones that, that do the ministry. Jonathan, I have a question. Um, do things like uh, those life pas passages come up? Have you been asked to do weddings or funerals? And, <clears throat> you know, Christmas is uh, Easter. What do Absolutely. People, what do people want to do at, at those times? Absolutely. Um, I've, um, well, our second art, experience we had a young lady that attended with her mother and aunt and she painted we talked about consider the birds of the air um from the beatitudes and we painted a robin looking up to the sky and three days later that young lady died of an overdose and their only faith connection uh was to those two ladies that own that art studio and they said could you please get a hold of pastor jonathan and I ended up doing her funeral. And what, what was on a, um, <laughs> I don't, I'll get a little emotional here. What was next to her coffin um, on a pedestal was the, that painting um, of that bird. Um, so that was, that was one of the, you know, the, the heart wrenching. I think ministry creates ministry. Um, and of course I've had weddings. I do have a young lady that came and, and she had given birth to a little girl. And I, I, I think without a shadow of a doubt um, that I'll probably be doing a baptism in a brewery. I, I, just, I just see that. I don't know if she's gonna come back to the brick and mortar to, to do that baptism or not, but she's sensing that she wants to have her daughter baptized by me. And like I said, ministry creates ministry. We, we recently had, um, well, not recently, but the past two summers, um, the congregations that I serve are both in Southeast Ohio, very impoverished Appalachian communities. And the problem with um, COVID and those kinds of things are that the broadband in our area is also very, very challenged. We just don't have the strength. Uh, we've tried to do Zoom meetings. They're very hard to do. We uh, do Facebook Live, but Zoom meetings are very hard to do. So um, as much as we can, we've done, um, distance things we're back to worship now but the last two summers we've had an ice cream truck we the congreg one of the congregations i call it the church on the hill it's in uh junction city ohio tiny um the congregation raised money to buy six hundred dollars worth of ice cream and we got in the truck and it was a week before, two weeks before Vic Amazing Grace Day Camp, which is a mm. synod sponsored vacation Bible school. And we went everywhere in that truck, everywhere, <laughs> shouting uh, the ice creams for free and the ice creams on Jesus tonight, you know, and just <laughs> having conversations with people. The other thing that I noticed at that time were just the surprise of people who would come out of their house with just a couple of bucks in their hand and just to hear that the church on the hill um, cares about you. We're here yeah. with you. We're here with you. We're not just up on that hill. And, yeah. and then the other thing that's come out of that is meeting the chief of police who wandered through Amazing Grace Day Camp, the Bible school, and I asked him to pray with the kids and he did. And then he um, knows the recovery community. So he used the church on the hill, this little tiny church from 1842 to host the first annual, it was called the first annual Junction City Narcotics Awareness Event. 
Mm. And there were like 60 people all in recovery at various stages of recovery gathered in that little sanctuary, sharing the stories of hope, sharing hope, also sharing about the pain they've gone through because of overdose, Mm. because of the death of friends and family due to overdose. Yeah. Yeah. And from, I mean, it, and, and then the, the ELCA offered daily bread grants. And I just started at these two churches three weeks before COVID hit. Hmm. And, and there's a lot of hunger, a lot of poverty, and a lot of addiction, and a lot of overdose deaths. So <laughs> we got two little $500 grants and started serving meals. Hmm. The one church, which I call the church on the corner, is in a small village and they were so excited about serving meals we serve them carry out because people can't come inside um but i made me think of jesus and the disciples going out and they came back and they were just da, 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 just so excited and the pioneers god bless those pioneers I'm seeing them appear and, and, and you can tell they just kind of levitate through the room. They're so excited about ministry. So the church on the corner, because $500 doesn't last forever, even though it's matched, they saw an opportunity to be a part of a new Lexington fall festival this weekend, a tent talk about the Holy spirit. We had a tent there. We have one pioneer so excited. We served hot chicken sandwiches and homemade cookies and bottled water and were able to raise $750 for that community dinner to continue. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we've also met some people who are advocating, it's called Never Alone Ohio, to walk alongside of people who have, who, who are hoping for recovery and to also walk alongside people who have lost a loved one to overdose and they came and shared the tent with us we you know they asked we we invited them yes absolutely so we had we had a a con confluence of (laughs) the little lutheran church on the corner never alone ohio and then along came homelessness advocacy a group wanting to do transitional housing in New Lexington, Ohio. So you just look, the Holy Spirit does all these things. Yeah. And and brick and mortar, no, but I can see where, I mean, the food truck idea, I'm like, man, you know, <laughs> I don't think that's too far off base. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were handing out Narcan. Yeah. Wow. You, you wow. have to, you know, and, and that's a lifesaver in Perry County, just as much as a hot meal. Mm-hmm. And it's all served in the love and grace of Christ. So Amen. I don't want to talk forever, but I really appreciate what you're saying. And I, I just, I, God bless the pioneers and what the, the, the what the spirit does. And Thank I you. can, uh, you've been inspiring to me to just keep on keeping on. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. God bless you. God bless you, Jonathan. So I realize I have already been part of a fresh expression. Didn't even really think of it as such. And when I started <laughs> for, when I started at First Lutheran in Dayton, uh, uh, we have both a breakfast downstairs every Sunday, and uh, there was somebody who had started a uh, coffee thing on Thursdays. And a couple of years before I got there and fewer and fewer people were coming to the coffee thing. So I said, well, why don't we take it over to there's a uh, senior citizen uh, disadvantaged and uh, uh, tower for them and disabled people about four blocks away. And some of those people were coming to our breakfast. But I'm like, well, when we finish coffee here, let's roll it down the street in a cart. And uh, so we started uh, a thing where they let us use a big room. And turns out that the uh, company that runs that is a faith-based organization. And so they were happy for us to be there. And so we just started with coffee and uh, donuts and whatever uh, Kroger was selling half price that day. And uh, 
before you know it, uh, we're taking prayer requests from people and we're up <laughs> to like 25 people every week. And That's awesome. So yeah. we were praying. And then one day I said, uh, what we were talking about this week, I've got a Bible story that's just great for that. And so we did Bible story. And a couple of weeks later, there's this tiny little piano and somebody said, well, let me play a song over there. And about the fifth time, some stuff like that had happened. I'm standing by the elevator and this woman looks at me. She says, that was a really nice service. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, uh, because of COVID, we can't be inside, but we now, uh, four o'clock every Thursday, we're there with, uh, this week we had various chips and cold drinks and stuff. And That's great. Hope to go back inside and pray with some people, but that is my happiest hour of the week. <laughs> amen that, that oh I, hour of the week. I i get it richard oh my gosh there's a there's a fresh expression that that meets at a mio's or not mio's a mo's um it's by bibles and burritos and it it always it doesn't always have to be a worship element it could just right. be gathering around the word and a devotion and asking questions sure. um yeah. yeah that's that's wonderful well but we have actually then even motivated the, the, the powers that be, the council and the executive team, because a couple of those people were part of that, to when we came back into uh, uh, worshiping in house, they said, let's move it at a half hour early and move the breakfast a half hour late and stop this thing. What we used to have a little service downstairs for the breakfast people, and then we had the big service upstairs and merged the service. And uh, <laughs> We've now got probably about a third of the people who uh, are attending our, our, our main service on Sunday mornings are people from hangover from breakfast. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. But still, I know there are people who at, at, over at the tower who aren't going to walk in the building. So that's not going to change what we're doing over there. That's awesome. And that might be the hardest thing you have to tell your people. <laughs> right that that this is not a way of going we're not going out fishing so that exactly. we can lure people in you know we're not going to hook them and then reel them mm -hmm. inside the church yeah um, absolutely and if you try to do that you will actually break faith with the people that you're reaching outside the church yeah, yeah. um you will yeah. just confirm their worst suspicions about christians so yeah you yeah. it but it's hard yeah. for your people to hear that because they love your church why wouldn't anybody love your church? They right. also don't necessarily want to hear that your church may have hurt somebody, probably yeah. has hurt somebody in the past. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, they... I have a good time playing against stereotype of what people would stereotype me. And uh, it's interesting being over there, you'll get somebody say some mild curse word and they're like, I know you're a pastor. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. I got to be dressed up to come into in anything. I don't care. So yeah. yeah, and I think I think the 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 coolest thing that I have. I mean, I I have my own flock outside the church. I really, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm the preaching pastor. One of the one of the preaching pastors at Anderson Hills, and but I would say most of my personal ministry, like the pastoral ministries, are people of having. A conversation with a person after not only after a fresh expression but i there was a lady that was going through uh cancer and then at the same time her daughter was diagnosed with bipolar and she was like pastor jonathan can we just meet for lunch and i'm like absolutely and yeah. so this was this is a lady that does not go to anderson hills <laughs> and she she goes to faith and friends on tap at the little miami brewing company and i i can see the faces of, of the ones that go to the various fresh expressions. And, and I have all of these tiny little flocks that make up a larger flock and I'm their pastor. I'm their pastor. And I've got two weddings coming up in 2022 from the little Miami brewing company. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so cool. Um, and I'll, I, I do, I do the premarital counseling at Anderson Hills and, and I'll do the premarital counseling with them. But, uh, the the uh, wedding venue is not Anderson Hills. Yeah. Oh, I, I sometimes wander around downtown, and, and it is gratifying that suddenly you have somebody two blocks away screaming, "Hey, pastor!" Yeah, yeah, that is yeah. that's awesome. 
Well, thank you, Pastor Jonathan, and, um, and all of you for contributing. I think we need to take a little bit of a break, um, but I, I hope you can come back because I want to tell you about what Cultivate is doing in Southern Ohio along these lines. So let's take a break. It, uh, my clock says it's 1123. Could we be back by 1130? And yes. Jonathan, yeah. you should let your dog out. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I will. And I will let I, mine I, out. <laughs> I, I will probably, uh, I'll probably be uh, heading out here. I've got a noon okay. uh, lunch with our a couple of staff members. So, but okay. uh, yeah. But thanks, thank Katie. Thank you let, so much. Let me know and if, be well. <laughs> you thank you. Take care. Thanks. Okay, I hope you guys are coming back. How sabbatical, Pastor Paget? Are you back now? No, I'm just getting ready to start. I start the October 1st. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, and then I'll be back the week before Christmas. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Look at that smile on your face. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. I got a lot Good. to do between now and then, though. I keep like processing my to do list of everything I have to like make sure happens before I go. But, sure. Yeah. yeah, sure. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> but yeah, looking forward to some time to just be still. <laughs> yes. Not running a million miles an hour. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is stop my video first, because when I am trying to be on and sharing my screen. Nope, this is what I want. Okay, and let's move guys out of the way. There, now you should be able to see, I think, a full, a full slide. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do today is give you an update on our Cultivate initiative to establish new Lutheran worshiping communities in Southern Ohio. And I want to start by reminding you that this initiative grows out of our Thrive campaign, uh, goal number four, especially launching new congregations and reaching new people. This is one of the five goals that the people of Southern Ohio discern together as part of our um, uh, listening process prior to the campaign. Uh, the, we, we had some ideas about what we thought the goals ought to be, and the people of Southern Ohio said no. Some of those are okay, but some of we need to give greater and higher priority some, to some others. And one of those goals that was added was the launching of new congregations, reaching new people. Um, and that's because we have long wanted to extend our ability to share the good news about Jesus. And we have been stymied by a lack of funding. But I will also be honest and say that we have also been struggling a little bit by with the recognition that the traditional planting of our traditional congregations might not be our best strategy in this new context in which we find ourselves. Our existing congregations are facing such significant challenges in our changing world and duplicating that model as the world continues to change around us didn't seem like the best investment of time and effort and resources. So we stopped to take our time to learn as much as we could about what works and what doesn't work in these times and in this context, our North American context, but specifically in Southern Ohio. 
But thanks be to God, there are other models available to us and there are generous leaders willing to share what they have learned. And there are energetic and passionate people who are leading the way. And so as we think about how best to share the good news about Jesus in new contexts, we are proposing a more flexible and nimble approach, one that adapts our outreach to those contexts and also taps into the significant reservoir of lay talent and passion that we have at our disposal. So what we are imagining is the establishing of small worshiping communities under the leadership of active and committed disciples with the support of local pastors. Some of these communities will be birthed out of existing congregations and may well contribute to the revitalization of our existing congregations because we've seen that happen. Others may be regional projects that are supported by congregations in a particular area and others may be standalone projects. Some of these may really take off and become larger congregations that look a lot like our existing congregations but many of them may not. Some may have long lives. Others may serve their communities only for a season. As long as they are drawing people into relationship with Jesus and growing them as disciples, we believe they will be serving God's purpose. Such an approach allows us to engage in holy experimentation, to learn as we go, to encourage organic growth, without the added pressure of meeting all of the expectations that we currently tend to impose on congregations. So this is your Cultivate team. Um, they have been together uh, really since June of this year, although um, Ben Morris, our chair, has been engaged in this work for about a year now. Um, these are all people who have expressed both a passion for planting new faith communities and an understanding of what our landscape requires here in Southern Ohio. Ben Morris is our fearless leader from the Cincinnati area, and he is the engineer that keeps this track, uh, this train on its track. Right behind him is JT Burcham, uh, who comes to us, another layperson, come, coming to us from Lutheran Saints in Ministry in Fairborn with a heart for ministry to people in the heartland. Pastor Richard Freudenberger is a mission developer and pastor in the Dayton area with a strong commitment to urban ministry. And Pastor Alice Connor serves in our campus ministry at the University of Cincinnati. All of these people are think outside the box people and all of them have extensive experience working outside our traditional congregations, engaging with non-Lutherans. We are in the process of establishing some infrastructure. A web page, cultivatesouthernohio.com, is a standalone site, um, but it is accessible through our Synod website. Just search for Cultivate and click on that, and you'll find the link to the website. But we, we designed this standalone site to be accessible to people outside our church, as well as inside our church. We also have a Facebook group. Um, this is a private page, um, but it's for anyone who is interested in the work of establishing new faith communities. We imagine this as a home for both the team and for potential planters and those who want to support them. This is right now the place where we exchange um, thoughts, ideas, um, resources, articles uh, about emerging churches, emerging congregations, emerging communities. It is easier to get the ball rolling if you have a little bit of momentum. And we were able to start with a couple of easy wins. These are two communities that our team was already helping to get started when Cultivate officially launched earlier this year. Uh, the beloved community of Takoon Farm is our synod authorized worshiping community birthed out of Takoon Farm social ministry in Mount Healthy. And then there's Ga Gather Cincinnati, which is a much less formal worshiping, actually they're both pretty informal, um, 
It is a, a, a less formal worshiping community bringing young adults in the Cincinnati area together roughly once a month for fellowship and discipleship, along with a quarterly worship service at one of their partner congregations. These were easy wins for us because not much equipping was required to get them started, and we were able to offer relatively modest financial support for them. Takoon Farm is led by Pastor Mary Lehman, who needs no equipping at all, um, and they will be receiving ELCA, ELCA partnership support as well as synod partnership support once we get all the paperwork done. Gather Cincinnati is led by a layperson, Elizabeth Gilbert, um, and we have been providing her with, the, with support and mentoring and are rounding up the training that she needs uh, as she works. She's training on the job. She was already very gifted. Uh, we have some upcoming events. You can see that we are in the rostered ministers workshop right now as we speak. Uh, but we also are planning a Cultivate Visioning Day for lay people to introduce this vision to them and to invite them into this work. Our lay people are, in general, not accustomed to thinking of themselves as partners in ministry, let alone as church planters. But this work will not succeed without, without their active engagement. This initiative is very dependent upon activating our lay people as the priesthood of all believers. We believe that with equipping and encouragement, our lay people can and will be our best evangelists and planters. Pastors will have an important role to play in equipping our lay people for this work through formation and discipleship training, through identification and development of potential planters and leaders, and through encouragement in this work of extending the kingdom of God through the sharing of the gospel but it will be lay leaders who will do most of the cultivating through these new communities. We have this event um, on our calendar for November 6th at Peace Beaver Creek, but I will tell you that as an in-person event right now, we are keeping a very close eye on COVID numbers, and we do not believe we can do this day effectively online. So there is some possibility that we may decide that we have to delay this until the spring. Um, it's not looking very good right now, but the team will make that decision uh, uh, next week and then we will announce as need, make announcements as needed. We're also, uh, after that lay visioning event, hoping to launch um, a recruitment tour, which is an opportunity to travel throughout the Synod, meeting with interested folks in each conference to hear their ideas for a new community. Then we can consider how our team can support and encourage these folks and their ideas and see them become a reality. So the recruitment tour is sort of the first step where we invite people to come and share their ideas, their dreams, and then we think about how we can come alongside them and equip them in a variety of ways. And equipping is our focus right now. Oh, let me back up and say before I do that, um, that we are not reinventing the wheel. Uh, you've just heard from Jonathan Coleman, um, but we have actually invested a lot of time and research into finding out how others are doing this work. There have been lots and lots and lots of conversations with people in the ELCA and in other denominations, both across the country and in Southern Ohio over these last two years. But we are perhaps most indebted to our siblings uh, in the West Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church, starting with a trip to Cincinnati, probably about three and a half to four years ago um, to, to their office to hear about their new start initiatives and many, many more conversations. We probably have monthly conversations, if not more frequently at some times. The West Ohio Conference has been amazingly generous with their time, their experience and their support and encouragement. They have, as you've heard from Pastor Jonathan, more examples of successful experiments in our territory, in our context. And they've also um, made themselves available to us as presenters to both our rostered ministers and to our lay folks at our introductory events. Our lay visioning event will feature 
um, Brad Acock from uh, who is uh, Jonathan's boss in the com the West Ohio Conference office. And what they've been helping us with is equipping, um, equipping potential planters. They have, in their generosity, our Methodist siblings have offered us access to their training program for planters in West Ohio. This is called the Greenhouse, which we think will be a great training resource for our planters with some Lutheran supplements added to it. Um, coincidentally, the ELCA has also discovered UMC uh, experience with church planting, and they just piloted an online training program for lay planters using a UMC program and are now in the process of refining that program for Lutherans um, and also uh, providing it in Spanish re language resources. Um, this will offer us an additional resource for equipping. The ELCA also offers annual training um, and equipping for mission developers, which would be appropriate additional support, but we don't believe it would be our own, should be our only resource. And then finally, Southern Ohio has been developing resources as well that we hope to make use of our new Lay Leadership Academy and our newly revitalized Lay School of Theology, which is now known as LOFT, Living Our Faith Together. We hope through those two programs to be able to offer individuals, uh, individual planters additional equipping on an as needed basis. Our hope is to offer foundational equipping for six to 12 months as planters are dreaming and researching and, and preparing to plant and then uh, continuing support through the planting process and then provide them with accompaniment and mentoring for an additional year or so. This accompaniment would be a requirement for synod funding. And so as we move forward, um, this effort is going to need resources, financial resources, um, and funding is gonna depend upon our synod priorities and the availability of those funds. Some funds are gonna be needed for recruiting and equipping planters, as well as supporting the team in its work. But the primary expenditure that we imagine will be to provide seed money to encourage new communities as they are getting started. Some projects we imagine will be quite small. As you could hear Pastor Jonathan, many of his started out as very small projects. Others uh, may be more ambitious. And so we imagine that grant awards will vary um, according to the size of the project. Grant applications will be assessed as to the needs of the project, evidence of support from ministry par uh, partners because None of these projects will be able to make it on just uh, Synod's funding. They're going to need support from other partners. Uh, and evidence of careful community research, which is absolutely foundational. Um, we imagine what people might need in our communities, but if we don't actually go out and ask them, uh, we will make big mistakes. So that careful community research will be actual will be absolutely required as a part of the process. And this process, we will be walking potential planters through as we teach them. As of right now, this initiative is entirely dependent upon the Thrive campaign. Uh, we're very excited by the potential for growth, which Cultivate offers both in the form of new worshiping communities, bringing new people into relationship with God and with us. But we are also excited by the growth that we anticipate in strengthening our existing congregations and the whole synod as together we answer Jesus's call to make new disciples through this initiative. We are convinced that the whole synod and every congregation in it will be blessed by this important work. Let me stop sharing my screen and become visible to you. And then um, that is a very brief introduction. So I invite you to ask your questions. What questions did you bring that I didn't answer?
comments. Apparently, we're very thorough. <laughs> I remember one of the reasons that we talked about having this event today was to talk also about uh, getting buy-in from our regions of pastors that this is not going to be something threatening to their individual congregations. Yes. And yes. that reg regional cooperation is really going to be helpful. Yes. Yes. Uh, for example, Tacoon Farm, the beloved community at Tacoon Farm, um, already had a reservoir of goodwill and support among the Cincinnati area congregations. Um, and so they already, they have that support for the beloved community at Tacoon Farm. And that makes all the difference. Um, but that doesn't mean that we didn't get a phone call or two from a pastor who said, wait, what do you mean you're establishing a new worshiping community uh, just uh, you know, um, a few miles from my church, uh, aren't we, why aren't we good enough, <laughs> basically, is what they were saying, and, um, and, and we responded with, um, of course, that you are doing, we appreciate all of the ministry that you're doing, but the fact of the matter is, is that you can't reach everyone, and not everyone will walk through your doors, and we can't just say we've done enough, um, by by saying uh, by pointing people to you, if if for a variety of reasons they will not cross your threshold, and in fact the the two the uh, Tacoon Farm does very different things. Um, they are not in competition with one another. They do very very different things. They they worship on a different at a different time. They have a completely different worship style. Um, they're the people who go to the beloved community at Tacoon Farm are not members of any other Lutheran church. They're not drawing people out of Lutheran congregations, although they have been invited to send their people to be welcoming on this alternate date. Um, so that, and also so they can see what's happening there and realize how very different it is. Um, uh, yeah, and, I think, and I think it's also important to know that, that what we're trying to create here are, are opportunities for people who wouldn't normally go through um, into, a, into your buildings um, for whatever reason. And as Pastor Jonathan said, I'm sure he's heard, and I know that you all have heard the stories of, of why why people left church or aren't engaged in in a ministry because the church hurt them um, in some way shape or form and and to walk into to our buildings especially if you've been hurt by the church is very difficult um, and and folks that are hurt by the church it might not have been lutherans who hurt them it might have been um, let's say Roman Catholic, it could have been Methodist, it could have been Episcopalian. And so to get them to come into a church building that looks and feels and speaks like we oftentimes do, we need to make sure that we have opportunities for people um, to engage in, in knowing Jesus and knowing God's love through Jesus in a different way. So I want you to hear that this is not in competition with what we have. This is in addition to what we it, can be. Yeah. And, and it is, there is absolutely no reason. There's a whole category of fresh expressions that are launched by existing congregations. Um, there is absolutely no reason why an existing congregation can't launch a fresh expression. But it does mean that it does mean leaving your building. It does mean finding third spaces. It does mean not expecting or putting pressure on those who join you in that third space to come back to the mothership. <laughs> I, Jonathan didn't use that phrase today, but I've heard him do it. It always makes me laugh when he says it. Um, 
it's uh, there is no reason why exi and existing congregations who do engage in pre establish fresh expressions outside their walls do find themselves rejuvenated and revitalized by the work. Right, it is incredibly revitalizing work. Um, and we've been working through the collaborative, trying to encourage congregations to engage in ministry outside their walls. It's a critical component of revitalization work. Um, this is just another approach, another resource or program that we can offer to congregations who want to do that, but don't feel that they particularly wanna go through um, the collaborative. The final, the other piece that uh, we thought pastors might want to hear is that they might hear this as, we expect you to do more work. We expect you to lead these fresh expressions in your existing churches. Um, and that is actually not what we're saying at all. We're saying this work will actually be more effective and your lay people will be stronger if you bring them into the work, if you draw them into the work and equip them into the work, if you're doing the, the, the formation work that we hope every pastor is doing in their congregations, then you are bound to see some people arise out of that work who might be excited about sharing the gospel. Um, and this gives them a life-giving ministry to participate in. Um, it, is very helpful if pastors don't believe that they're the only ones who can do ministry. And I don't I, think, I don't, I don't we, think, <laughs> go ahead, Dick, Richard, go ahead. We have a very different uh, way of uh, funding pastor salaries than the Methodists do, but I yes. was really intrigued by what he was talking about, the sort of hybrid appointment that he has. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. The body Bonnie has a question. Yes, Bonnie. Could, could you define to Takoon Farms? Looking on their website, it looks like it's a place of growth and healthiness, but I'm not sure if that's a retreat center. Is that a, a place to come and do something for a while? I see there's a free market yoga. Yes, Takoon Farm uh, began as a social service ministry. Um, that offers um, support to their local community in food, um, feeding ministries through um, job training, apprenticeship, uh, a variety of, of those kinds of resources. They, um, they have a, it's on a farm. They do some farming. That's, uh, they, uh, creation care is another important uh, aspect of their identity and um and the work that they do so they're in the they feel a sense of call to restoring the earth and and community in a variety of ways um so they started out as as a, a social service ministry and they've been going ooh, i think almost 10 years um in that work and that was how they became known it's a standalone ministry uh it's not an ELCA ministry, although they have um, applied for and received ELCA grants, like for instance, food ministry grants. Um, one of the first mental health ministry grants went to Takoon Farm um, when they opened up those grants for the work that they do. Uh, but over the last two or, well, we started talking with them about it when I first started asking if they had thought about also including a worship aspect. They do retreats um, and they, they often have a, worship, a tiny little worship component as part of their service days. But we asked if they were interested in expanding that a little bit further and they weren't quite ready for that. Um, but starting about a year ago, um, they started to say, you know, so this seems like the next logical step for us, that health and wholeness, which is our calling uh, and restoration, uh, also has that worship contributes to that as well. And we would like to offer a worshiping community here in this place, a worship opportunity of, for those who wouldn't walk through the doors of a church. Um, and so it is more of a, it has a mindfulness, contemplative 
um, aspect to it. Um, for instance, they, they have had a drumming circle for a long time. They bring the drumming circle into the worship and start with a drumming circle. So there is so so the person who walks in from a traditional Lutheran congregation will look at this and go, wait. <laughs> but all of the essential Lutheran components are there. Uh, so they started in the, uh, excuse me, early summer. Uh, and they are, I think, at a once a month worship service on a Wednesday night. And then as they grow organically, um, they will probably multiply the number of services they have per month, but it'll probably still be on Wednesday. Um, and they also offer a regular uh, service opportunity. I think it's on the first Saturday of the month. And they're thinking about adding a worship component, small worship component to that service day um, in the same way that any one of us might add a worship component to a servant event as well. So, so the beloved community uh, is the name of the, of Tacoon Farm is the name of the worshiping community, which is hosted at Tacoon Farm. And right now, I believe they just have a, a page on their website. At some point in the future, they may move to their standalone website. So Dan, Jacob, and I recently had a conversation where we were talking about different kinds of worship. And he points out that when you're thinking about that, that there are a lot of Lutherans in our Senate who have experienced a different kind of worship at our camps. Yes. But, you know, try to put that together because I think a lot of people found that very meaningful. So you, different things can be done and we can get our minds out of even though i love high high church we can get right. our minds out of the only way to do things right yeah there are a lot of people for whom the best day it's a lot of pastors remember who had the oh, best yeah. worship day at, at uh seminary was often the camp day right the when somebody would say we're going to do it we're going to do camp worship and everybody be yay <laughs> we love so many of our of our pastors came out of that uh that camping experience um Yes, and in fact, I have been in conversation with Lomo for probably about three or four years off and on. COVID, there have been, they faced other challenges, but they are actively exploring at Lomo um, how they can uh, establish, offer the opportunity for a worshiping community or two or three uh, at the camps. Um, so there's that possibility. Uh, Allie Maisie was their programming director, but she's not, not there anymore. But uh, I, she contacted my house to ask, not me. <laughs> she wanted my husband to come and do um, some programming and worship um, in environmental, um, environmental history with an environmental focus um, in uh, maybe perhaps with birds, but not necessarily restricted to that as He's pretty wide ranging in his interests. So here how that affinity, right? These are, we're talking about affinities that can be used to draw people together and then um, offer them an opportunity to worship and praise God uh, and connect that part of their life to their spirituality too, which kind of brings us back full circle to where we started this morning <laughs> when we were talking about um, breaking down the walls between our the ways we categorize our lives and allowing God and the Holy Spirit to flow through all of them and helping people see the connections, how God is working through their passions and interests and friendships and um, families and, uh, you know, all of those things that bind human beings together uh, and make our lives richer. God makes even more rich um, when God is allowed a chance to to get into our pigeonholes uh, and do God's will. And I think that's what Pastor Santiago put in the chat. Um, oh, so yes. yeah, thanks yeah, for there'll that. Be more, there'll, be, there'll be more resources. There will be other opportunities. It's, it's real, I'm really excited about, about this ministry and this, this kickoff because I think that as Pastor Kerrigan said, we've got lay people who think that because they're lay people that they shouldn't have ideas and shouldn't be doing ministry. 
And one of our focuses for the coming year is how are we equipping our people to be disciples um, so that, that their gifts are used. These new ministries don't have to be started by us. And right. I'm saying all of us, because we're all ordained ministers mm -hmm. of word and sacrament. We need to get back, as Pastor Kerrigan has been telling us all, to be the priesthood of all believers and really embrace that. Mm -hmm. uh, you all are busy. So <laughs> let others who have a passion um, for, for a ministry and go, hey, okay, let's experiment. Um, I'm going to be talking with outside the, on my outside the box team about holy, holy experiments. Um, and, you know, it's okay if they try. Um, give them that permission to, to try and to succeed and to try and to tweak it and, and not see it as a failure. Anything you can learn from is, is a gain, right? So it's about having a learning spirit. So uh, years ago, I developed this question that I, I would ask councils, congregational councils. I would say, are you gatekeepers or permission givers? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it made them think about the ways in which they led the congregation um, the ways in which they might be stifling creativity and ministry if they were engaged in gatekeeping. But permission giving is a whole different way of looking at how you, um, you deal with people who might have ideas. The same thing tr is true of pastors, right? Pastors can be either, this is a gross simplification, but they can be either gatekeepers. Um, I'm the pastor here. I'm the one who does ministry. Um, nobody else knows as much as I, nobody else, these people didn't go to seminary. I went to seminary, I know. The, uh, so they tend to think of themselves as the experts who should need to be in charge. Or they can be permission givers um, and say, wow, that is a really awesome idea. How can I equip you for this, this call that God is, is putting before you? Because if someone is interested in an idea, they're experiencing a sense of call. Um, not all ideas are good ideas, <laughs> but, uh, but there are ways in which you can sort of talk or talk with people about things. A permission giving spirit is what I would like to most to see in our pastors as we move forward in this initiative, that they encourage their lay people to start thinking them, of themselves as ministers thank them for the ministry they already do and encourage them to think about the ministry they could be doing out in the world, making disciples for Jesus. And yes, indeed, Pastor Kinnanen with the ski patrol, you, you, you began that fresh expression. Good, good. <laughs> Several years ago, but I'm thinking that Emmanuel's the folks who decided to have uh, serve meals to the community. They extended their service to a second week a month, um, and they deliver to all of the people in the neighborhood who have needs or desires to be fed. There's another book I'd like to recommend. Um, it's called Growing Young. Can I lay my hands on it? Uh, it's a green book. <laughs> uh, I think probably every, every pastor ought to be reading this book and thinking about, um, they talk about handing over the keys. Um, and they insist that the key to growing our congregations younger, which every congregation says it wants, right? They want more young people in the congregation. That they insist that the key to doing this is handing over the keys, not retaining in the tight clenched hands of the pastor and the elder leadership, the keys to the congregation and its ministries, but handing over the keys as people are ready for them to do ministry. The presumption being that people will be ready when they are equipped. So I lift that up as a book that you might, um, that might uh, be interesting to your lay people, and then they will learn some great habits of thinking that will lead them into this kind of work. 
Anne, what time is it? It is 12.09. You guys have been so patient. <laughs> um, if no, if you don't have an additional question. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. You. Share the Thank good news. You. All with right. Your colleagues. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.